Your question to President Reagan. Mr. President, I want to raise an issue that I think has been lurking out there for two or three weeks and cast it specifically in national security terms. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> If I still have time, I might add, Mr. Truitt, I might add that um, it was Seneca or it was Cicero, I don't know which, that said, if it was not for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. Mr. President, I'd like to head for the fence and try to catch that one before it goes over, but, but I'll go on to another question. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President... Distinguished members of the Congress, honored guests, and fellow citizens. Today marks my first State of the Union address to you, a constitutional duty as old as our republic itself. President Washington began this tradition in 1790 after reminding the nation that the destiny of self-government and the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty is finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. For our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say, I did not actually hear George Washington say that. But it is a matter of historic record. On our way here in Air Force One, I was looking down over the, your countryside out here because most of the way from Oklahoma, I was looking down at clouds. And uh, I could say that it reminded me of a story, but actually I wanted to tell the story whether anything reminded me or not. <laughs> it was about a fellow that was driving down a country road and all of a sudden I looked out and there beside him was a chicken. He was doing about 45 and the chicken was running alongside. So he stepped on the gas, he got it up to about 60 and the chicken caught up with him and was right beside him again and then he thought, was he was looking at him, that the chicken had three legs. But before he could really make up his mind for sure, the chicken took off out in front of him at 60 miles an hour, turned down a lane into a barnyard. Well, he made a quick turn and went down into the barnyard too and there was a farmer standing there. And he asked him, he said, did, did, did a chicken come past you? And he said, yeah. Well, he said, am I crazy or did the chicken have three legs? And he says, yep, it's mine. He says, I breed three-legged chickens. <laughs> and the fellow said, for heaven's sake, why? Well, he says, I like the drumstick. Ma likes the drumstick. And now the kid likes the drumstick. And we just got tired of fighting for him. <laughs> and the driver said, well, how does it taste? He says, I don't know. I've never been able to catch one. <laughs> Well, seriously, since... Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. As Henry VIII said to each one of his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> I spoke of the difference between our two countries. I try to follow the humor of the Russian people. We don't hear much about the Russian people. We hear about the Russian leaders. But you can learn a lot because they do have a sense of humor and you can learn from the jokes they're telling. And one of the most recent jokes I found kind of, well, personally interesting, maybe you might tell you something about their country. 
The joke they tell is that an American and a Russian were arguing about the differences between our two countries. And the American said, look, in my country I can walk into the Noval office, I can hit the desk with my fist and say, President Reagan, I don't like the way you're governing the United States. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, what? He says, I can walk into the Kremlin, into Brezhnev's office, I can pound Brezhnev's nest, desk and I can say, Mr. President, I don't like the way Ronald Reagan is governing the United States. <laughs> I know that a lot of you have been having some fun with my advancing years. You even tied my recent surgery to my age. Well, I've got to be honest with you. I had that same operation when I was young, and it felt so good I wanted to have it done again before <laughs> I was too old. <laughs> but I am aware of my age. When I go in for a physical now, they no longer ask me how old I am. They just carbon date me. <laughs> Incidentally, I've got a news item for you. We have a spin-off from our Star Wars research. It's a helmet for me to wear at press conferences. All I do is push a button and it shoots down incoming questions. You have to admit, though, that my attitude is better than linebacker George Atkinson's when he was with the Oakland Raiders. Someone asked him what the player's reaction would be if the press box blew up. He said we'd have 30 seconds of respectful silence and then continue with enthusiasm. Now, honest, I don't feel that way. Maybe once in a while. <laughs> Nancy, would you like to join me up here for, please? I know it's getting late, dear, but it's not often that we have so many people who've written about us and broadcast about us <laughs> all together in one room like this, and I thought you might like to say a few nice words to them. <laughs> They're all from the press and radio and television. Maybe just a friendly little greeting would do. <laughs> How about just a word or two, something friendly, even one kind word. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> Seriously, my friends, as always, we've had our share of laughs tonight at one another's expense, which is as it should be in a city where the issues are important and the passions run so deep. Maybe the fun and good nature of evenings like this is a good place to start. So thank you for your hospitality and thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. In all the 36 anniversaries of my 39th birthday, this has certainly been <laughs> the most memorable. George, Barbara, all of you up here on the top shelf, together with me and all of you, ladies and gentlemen, I am enormously touched. Yes, today is my birthday. Seventy-five years ago, I was born in Tampico, Illinois, a little flat above the bank building. We didn't have any other contact with the bank than that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, here I am, sort of living above the store again. <laughs> and uh, you've already, it's kind of been touched upon here that, speaking of old times, you may have heard that tomorrow is my birthday. Now you know about that. I prefer to think of it as the 36th anniversary of my 39th, but I'll be just about due for a midlife crisis. <laughs> In fact, I'm thinking about a career change. <laughs> Drop this political business and 
See if I can't do something different like radio or the movies. Uh, well, maybe I'll give politics another three years. This time of the year always tends to be a summing up time for me. It's been swearing in time, and the new year every year, and a birthday, the 36th anniversary of my 39th birthday. Uh, I always think age is relative. There was once a very famous baseball pitcher, uh, Satchel Page. And no one quite knew how old Satchel was, but he still was throwing that ball. And uh, somebody asked him about that, and his wise answer was, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? <laughs> uh, that's how I came up with 39. Uh, well, the late Jack Benny had something to do with that. He was 39 for more than 40 years. I can't close without one story about doctors that he will understand very well. Have you ever noticed how easy it is if you're introduced to someone at a party or a dinner or something and, they, and he's introduced as doctor? And then there's always those people that suddenly start saying, Doctor, I've been having... And, uh, well, we had a fellow in show business, Moss Hart, the playwright, who was an inveterate along that line. And so one night at a cocktail party in Hollywood, he was introduced to a Dr. Jones. And almost immediately, he started talking about, I've been having this low back pain. And the fellow that introduced them said, Moss, Dr. Jones is a doctor of economics. <laughs> and that didn't stop Moss at all. He said, Doctor, I was buying some stock the other day. <laughs> no. Well, I don't want to go on too long. This is, after all, Las Vegas and... Outside just a moment ago, I saw a fellow trading ten passes to the Reagan talk for one ticket to Frankie Valley. <laughs> I'm mindful, too, that bringing things to a good conclusion is always a, a tricky business. You were told that I was a sports announcer, WHO Des Moines. Well, back in those days, the great evangelist Amy Semple McPherson was making a tour of the country holding revival meetings and one of them in Des Moines. Now, the station thought it would be a good idea, an enterprising public relations man, to interview Amy Semple McPherson. But why they picked a sports announcer to interview that noted evangelist, I'll never know. But there we stood in the studio and I asked her several what I thought were appropriate questions and then she answered graciously but then went into a very fervent plea about the success of her meeting. And I sat down. Until suddenly I heard her saying good night to our radio audience, and I looked up at the clock, and there were only four minutes to go. Well, I didn't know enough about Amy Semple McPherson that I could put on, that I could fill four minutes. So I got up, and in those days of radio and disc jockeys and so forth, I started thanking the noted evangelist Amy Semple McPherson and so forth, but I did like this, which means get a record ready. And the fellow out in the control room through the window reached out. There was always records around there for such contingencies, and picked one up and put it on the table and I said ladies and gentlemen we conclude this broadcast by the noted evangelist Amy Semple McPherson with a brief interlude of transcribed music I expected nothing less than the Ave Maria the Mills Brothers started singing Minnie the Moocher's Wedding Day She never did say goodbye. She just slammed the studio door. She, she went out. <laughs> and by the way, on the matter of the INF Treaty, I told the Senate not to worry about verification. I told them I'd take care of it. And while Gorbachev was here, I even made him write a hundred times, I will not cheat, I will not cheat. <laughs> oops, oops. Uh.
Well, now, during my presidency, I've always emphasized diplomacy. But sometimes it comes to the point you have to use force in foreign affairs. And here I am, arm wrestling General Norega for Panama. We really enjoyed our trip to China and were amazed that the population was over a billion people. And as you can see here, the lines are terrible. <laughs> <laughs>